morning, everyone. Welcome to the service this morning. Psalm 108, verses 1 to 3. My heart, O God, is quiet and confident, all because of you. Now I can sing my song with passionate praises. Awake, O my soul, with the music of his praises. I will awaken the dawn with my worship, greeting the daybreak with my songs of light. Wherever I go, I will thank you. All the nations will hear my praise songs to you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to join together today as a family to worship you. We are gathered to give thanks, to give you thanks and praise your goodness. And Lord, you are so worthy of it. We pray that you will refresh our hearts and our minds today. In your name, amen. Let's join together and worship our Father.
Father, this morning as we join together, we do worship your holy name. Father, we thank you for this time that we can spend together. May it be a blessing to you and to us this morning. Amen. Welcome. Hello, Tony. Isn't it a great day? Yes. I think it is. <laughs> if you're visiting with us, we've got a cup of tea out the back. Come and join us in that time. Come and have a chat. This week, Connect Groups is on Tuesday and Friday. Lady KYB is on Wednesday morning. I think Shannon should be back up and around by then. Uh, ladies Bible studies on Wednesday night. Coming up on the 4th of March. We can't be talking about March yet, can we? <laughs> but yet we are. World Day of Prayer, 4th of March at the Church of the Nazarene in Neptune Street. There's some more, there more details in your bulletin and we'll get some more details out around that next week. Last week, thank you to all those who um, completed the National Church Life Survey for me, for us. If you still want to do that, come and see me later and I'll give you a copy to fill out. And we'll contribute to the understanding of the church in Australia by doing that. If you listened to me last week, you would have realised that I forgot to mention birthdays and anniversaries. Tim and Brittany, happy anniversary for last Tuesday. Eight years. Congratulations. Wow. And Josh Tomlinson. Was it your birthday yesterday? It was. It was. <laughs> happy birthday. This week, it's Jackie's birthday today. But she's in transit back from Brizzy, so. Does she, does she know she's in transit? Yeah, yeah, I know. He knew that. <laughs> Sonny, is it your birthday on Tuesday? Happy birthday. <laughs> Judy, is it your birthday on Wednesday? Woohoo! We're on a roll here. <laughs> hey Dave, is it your wedding anniversary on Wednesday? It is. It is. <laughs> Congratulations, Dave and Judy. 42 years. 1980 they were married. And if I remember rightly, it was right about there, wasn't it? Congratulations. Don't forget, for your tithes and offerings, we've got a box at the front door out there. We've got a box in the, going into the hallway, or you can give online for your tithes and offerings. Young Skylar doesn't like going to kindy. Well, that's probably not true. He doesn't like being away from mum. Is that better? So he has a bit of trouble getting away from, from mum to go to kindy. So we'll pray for him this morning. John's going through his chemo treatment. He gets some nausea from that, so we'll remember him as well. Jack gets a bit of pain and he's going through some treatment planning, talking to the doc about how to manage that. June's sorting out some medical concerns and she's got some family concerns on her mind. So we'll keep her in our prayers. Shannon's recovering from shingles. Reese and Jackie have got their own health concerns and some pain going on, so we'll remember them. There's also a fellow we're aware of, a fellow called Ross Dodds. He's a retired pastor from Toowoomba. He's got some very serious health concerns, so we'll remember Ross and his wife Debbie as well. And as always, I don't know everything, so we've all got issues going on for ourselves as well, so um, we'll spend some time in quietness as well. Let's pray. Father, we've mentioned a number of names um, out loud already. Lord, for Skylar, heading off to kindy, Lord, we lift him up to you. We'll give him that sense of security that mum doesn't have to be there all the time, that life is full of 
great things. And Lord, help him to expand his awareness so that kindy is part of his world. Lord, we pray for his anxiety in a separation. Give him a sense of peace as he goes through these experiences. Lord, for John and his chemo treatment, Lord, we lift him up to you. For John and Jan, Lord, it's a tough journey. It's all got its own issues, Lord. So we, Lord, we lift up John to you. We pray for health for his body, for healing, and for that reassurance that he is not alone as he goes through this journey. Lord, for Jack, as he undertakes treatment planning with his medical team, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We thank you for his faith and how much of an effect that has on both himself and those around him. And Lord, we pray for his pain. Take away his discomfort and his pain. Give him that peace that comes from being pain-free. Lord, for June, as she sorts out the medical issues with her treating team, and for the anxiety she carries and the worry she carries for her family concerns, Lord. Lord, we lift her up to you this morning. Lord, be with her this morning. Heal her body. Give her treating team wisdom. And Lord, give her that reassurance that you are in all things and through all things and that you are a God of love. Lord, for Shannon recovering from shingles, Lord, we lift her up to you. May she take the time necessary to recover fully from this. We pray for health for her body and recovery, Lord. Lord, for Reese and Jackie, as they both experience pain, Lord, we continue to pray for recovery for what's going on in their bodies at this time, Lord. Lord, for Reese, we lift him up to you as pastor as he brings to us his, your word this morning. We pray for clarity of thought. We pray that we are um, open to the message that you have for us this morning. Lord, for Pastor Ross and his wife Debbie, as he goes through these serious health concerns, Lord, we lift them up to you. Lord, we pray for healing for his body for complete recovery so that he can return to being a faithful witness to you in whatever circumstances you put him into. Lord, we thank you for his faithful witness over these many years. We thank you that he's been willing to undertake the role of pastor um, previously. So Lord, we lift him up to you. We care for him and his wife. Lord, in these times of wars and rumours of war, in these times of strife within our families, in these times of natural disasters, of drought and famine, earthquakes and floods, Lord, we bring our anxieties and our fears to you. Be our strength and our shield. And Lord, teach us your ways, your way of love. Lord, we pray for unity within the church. Help us to encourage our leaders and each other. Help us to bear one another's burdens. Help us to be seen by our community and known for our love. Lord, help us to choose to be kind and understanding to one another. And Lord, help us to do it with grateful hearts. And this morning we give back to you a little bit of what you have given to us. Lord, the gifts that we bring in terms of our tithes and our offerings, as we bring them this week, Lord, we say thank you. We ask you to bless these gifts and to use them to further your kingdom. Father, we thank you that you are a true, loving God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. In a moment, we'll be coming into a time of worship, starting with uh, the song, This Kingdom. It's a song that tells about God's everlasting kingdom that is ruled by Jesus. That we may not live for today, 
for ourselves, nor for the pleasures of this world, but that we may live for an eternal kingdom that is near to come. Mark 1.15, now is the time. Here comes God's kingdom. Change your hearts and lives and trust this good news. In Hebrews 12.28, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. So let's join together in worship and honour our glorious Father and that we may experience God's kingdom. Jesus, God's righteousness revealed, the Son of Man, the Son of God, His kingdom comes,
and we thank you for that. Heavenly Father, as Reese comes to give us your word, may you bless his heart and bless the words that have come from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, Tiana. Thanks, team. Really appreciate the commitment of all of our teams that facilitate a, a season of worship as we gather to, to bring us together, to recognise. And, and the, the fact of the matter is, as Tiana said, uh, God's love is incomprehensible outside of the person of Jesus. Look, over the years, ministry has provided me some incredibly wonderful and exciting moments. Um, I once went with a team of, oh, and we're, we're actually entering our third message around uh, renewal in the kingdom of God around individual renewal. So that's the context that we're talking about this morning. So I, I went, went with a team of pastors to the Solomon Islands to celebrate the centenary of the birthing of the South Sea Evangelical Church, known as the SSEC. And, and uh, it was at Malu on the island of Malaita up in the north. And this was a festival commemorating the time when Peter Wambuotha returned to Malu a Christian. He'd been blackbirded to work as a Kanaka labourer in the cane fields of Bundaberg. When he returned home, he began sharing the love of Jesus with his relatives and initially many people opposed Peter in some quite horrible ways actually. But they were only to become followers of Jesus as a result of a number of miracles and at this festival there were five miracle sites. I can't specifically remember the miracles but it's you know if you wanted to check it out it's all there quite fascinating and distinct miracles not just a little bit of hocus pocus or you know pixie dust this is this was the real deal now having no education or experience peter reached out to the queensland kanaka mission for help and florence young she then began leading um, missionary trips into the solomon islands both to teach this fledgling group of believers the core truths of the gospel and the nature of the kingdom, but also to extend missionary endeavours further into the islands. And then wind forward around about 80 years or more, um, in, 19, in the 1970s, that revival broke out. I don't know if any of you have seen the, the book Fire in the Islands, just an amazing story of genuine Holy Spirit revival. And so now over 90% of Solomon Island is a Christian. And their response to this phenomenal and sustained movement of the Spirit was to launch the Deep Sea Canoe Mission. And that was launched on the 14th of July, 1994. Now that was an auspicious day because the 14th of July happens to be my birthday. Quite fascinating. But the whole purpose of, of the Deep Sea Canoe Mission was to take the gospel back. The islanders considered themselves as the outermost part of the earth. If you put a spear through the center of the earth from Jerusalem, it will come out in the islands. They saw themselves as the outermost part. And their response was to send the gospel back to Jerusalem with the fire of revival. And I was privileged to be there. And I still remember being at a gathering of thousands of people from all over the Solomon Islands and internationally. Lauren Cunningham was there from YWAM. They had an international speaker from one of the African nations from WEC, a CEO of WEC, Bible translators speaking. And I still remember being on my face, seeking the Lord for revival of my life in tears of gratitude to God, to be part of this wonderful and historic celebration, but also aware of the dryness and hardness of my own life and desperately wanting to bring the flame of revival back to Australia. 
In some respects, not a lot has changed. But in other ways, everything has changed. And particularly my understanding of revival or renewal. And what that really is all about. You see, what I've learned is that revival or renewal is a way of life. It's something to be pursued, discovered, and developed in the everyday. Rather than praying and waiting for God to do something, renewal is simply a daily rediscovery and response to what God has already done. I'm sure we've all been in prayer meetings where people are praying for revival, praying for revival, praying for revival, but no idea of what it is they're praying for. It's actually a response to what God has already done in Christ. In such a way that rejuvenates our hearts in our commitment to Jesus and his purposes. As Tiana read in Mark 1 and 15, the kingdom of God really is near. This idea of praying and praying and praying and waiting for God to do something before revival or renewal. No, sorry. The renewal journey begins the moment we respond to the call to be transformed in the context of God's kingdom rule and reign it's the whole picture of Isaiah 52 and 7 how beautiful on the mountains of the feet of him who bring good news and what's that good news our God reigns so Jesus said it like this a little bit different he said the time has come The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God. What we've been talking about recently has been the kingdom of God being the place of God's sovereign rule and reign. That Isaiah 52, 7. Our God reigns. God's kingdom is most notably evidenced in the reconciliation and restoration of all things. You might remember we talked about this the other week where we talked about renewal in the kingdom of God. Renewal is the way of the kingdom of God, culminating in the renewal of all things of Revelation 21 and 5. But Colossians 1 and 20 talks about how God in Christ reconciles to himself all things. How much is all? Everything. One of the things I noticed in the Solomon Islands when we went over there, um, we did a bit of a speaking tour as well, and there were some amazing other stories that I could... We wouldn't have enough time to get through the sermon if I shared all of the stories. We'd still be here at the end of next week. So I'll spare you on those, but I'm happy to talk about it. But um, one, one evening we went out with the church across a couple of other communities to another church. And the very first thing that happened as these two churches came together, they reconciled all of their differences, all of them. They owned their stuff and apologized for their stuff. They put things right, put off actions and attitudes that had led into the the tension between the two groups. And wow. Then they worshipped. Then the community just, and the spirit was released and just took off. Wow. An evidence of the kingdom of God, most notable in the restoration and reconciliation. You see, we live live in a world that's characterized by self-interest, selfishness, and sin. Conflict, division, and schism. I was talking to my mentor, Tim, Tim Dyer, through the week. He's saying he's never seen anything like it. Pastors leaving churches all over the nation, left, right, and center. He was advised on Monday morning that three families' marriages had crashed and burned. The schisms, the strife, the trauma, the conflict, 
talking to Keith Stevenson in a separate conversation, talking about what's happening in the churches in the wider, wide bay. I've got to tell you, it's tough out there. But you know, even though we, work, we live in a world of this, sin, self-interest and self-centeredness, the promise of God is new life. Restoration. And that comes not as we defend our turf, but as we actually give ourselves away. And it was Jesus who came to reveal explicitly the kingdom of God, that it be explicitly manifest. Jesus said that the time is coming, that, sorry, with his coming, the time is fulfilled. It is fulfilled. And this idea of time, it's not a chronos kind of set your watch kind of, oh yeah, at the third stroke, it will be 9, 37 and 20 seconds. Beep, beep, beep. Do you remember that? It used to ring up for the time. Do you remember that? <laughs> no, no, not that sort of time. Not Kronos calendar time, but rather, sorry, rather Kairos time. Kairos is Lord, Lord focused time, God's providential time. Jesus says that this is God's moment. This is God's appointed time for the kingdom to be revealed. But he didn't just say it's the time for it to be revealed. He said the time is fulfilled. And that fulfillment is about the fulfillment of all the prophecies, the many prophecies about the coming Messiah. That Jesus fulfills all of them. They come to pass. And Jesus is talking about a now. A now reality. This Jesus is not just talking about preparing us for the last day of our life for the hereafter. Jesus is not just talking about the pie in the sky when we die. He is talking about the steak on our plate while we wait. Or for those who might be vegetarian, a nice marinated steak of uh, eggplant that's been marinating in some nice juices in the fridge for about a couple of hours and then it's charred and sealed and yummy. But he's talking about the fullness of abundant life in the here and now. That's what the word at hand means. It means the kingdom present now, something new is happening. Something small, but big. Something long promised and desperately needed. And that's the reason why Jesus' proclamation is declared good news. You might remember I explained the word euangelion. It has to do with a political announcement. Well, here... It is political as well. It relates to a new realm, a new order, a kingdom. And its politic is governed by mercy, compassion, justice, loving kindness and faithfulness. Who doesn't want that? We'd have to be nuts to say no to those things, wouldn't we? Not only does it have a politic of those amazing characteristics and qualities, it has a king who fulfills them all in a rightful exercise of those things without apology. You see, at his baptism, Jesus is declared son of God, the anointed one, Messiah. Jesus' baptism declares that he is completely disobliged to the old political system of get what you can, while you can, whenever you can. When Jackie and I first drove into, into Canberra, we were driving in, uh, 
anyway, whatever the, can't remember the name of the road, the main road. And on the road, there was, there was obviously been a self crested white cockatoo that had been hit by a truck because uh, the birds couldn't call out car. car. Sorry. All right. No, no, this is actually a true story. This is a true story. So here's this self crested cockatoo, and there's a crow. Remember, car, car. Anyway, there's a crow pulling this self crested cockatoo off the road. And I thought to myself, oh, Look at that, isn't that great? One bird helping another bird. And then I stopped and did a rethink. I thought, nah, that's its dinner. <laughs> it's a dog eat dog world out there. Jesus declares his son. And it's a, you know, God declares his son Jesus, I beg your pardon, as king. It is a royal designation. The gospel announcement that the kingdom is near. There's not a new kid in town. There's a new king in town. God's own son. He's the promised king, the Messiah, the one who establishes God's manifest kingdom here, now. And what's more, he invites us. He invites us to participate with him. Whoa, how good is that? And Jesus uses the phrase, entering the kingdom through his ministry many times. We don't enter the kingdom unless we are born again, which really, I don't know that we really understand, and that'll be a conversation for next week, because it's not about a privatised individual experience that we've made it to be. When we talk to one another and we say, have you been born again? We miss the gravity of what Jesus is saying, but that's next week. There you go. Come and get the goss on that one. But to summarise, entrance to this kingdom and receiving the promises of God's salvation, Jesus uses two words. And the first is repent, metanoia. Now, we think that repentance is we get a slap on the back of the hand because we've got our hand caught in the cookie jar and we miss the point. We miss the point. We've all heard that repentance is about a change of heart and mind that leads to a change of action to do God's will. But repentance is way, way much more than that. You see, the word metanoia gives us a hint. There's a related word, very closely related, metamorphosis. Does that ring any bells for anyone? What's it about? Butterfly in a cocoon, grub in a cocoon, actually. And in the cocoon, it turns to mush and comes out the other side, a butterfly. It's about a complete transformation. So this invitation of metanoia, it's an invitation to transformation that we walk a new path according to the ways of Jesus. Loving God with all that we are. Loving our neighbour because they are just like us. Taking up our cross to follow him. Does that mean we're perfect? No. No. It means we're transformed. You might remember a couple of weeks ago, Jackie, in her, in her preach, talked about the Japanese art of kintsugi, where they took a, a, a clay pot that was broken down and put it back together with gold that, that filled the cracks. And there's a, another story around this that I really, really like. You might remember the old Jewish crooner, Leonard Cohen, in his song, The Album, The, the Anthem, and the, the chorus of that song, ring the bell that still can ring, and in my heart, that's the gospel. Forget your perfect offering. In other words, own up to our brokenness. He says there are cracks in everything. That's how the light gets in. You see, when we were perfect, we didn't want him. Adam and Eve pushed him away. 
We didn't want him. It's the cracks that let the light in, but not only so. It's the cracks that make the light accessible to others. Beautiful picture, Jackie. Absolute gorgeous picture of what God does with us. He patches us together with gold and precious silver. Light shines within us and out of us. So repentance is this transformation. But then Jesus goes on to say, it's not just about that. It's about believing, placing your trust in Jesus and what he's done. It means that we trust in God and God's promises fulfilled in Christ. Oh, by the way, how many of God's promises are yes in Christ Jesus? All of them. All of them. It means we believe the promised kingdom is here now. It means we believe the king who brings God's grace to us, who brings us freedom from Satan, sin and death, who brings us forgiveness and restoration in our relationship with God and new life. Reclothed in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit enfolds us. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. It's like, it's like a ship being enfolded, that gets shipwrecked on a reef and is enfolded in the water. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's not separate to the hope that we hold in Christ, but fundamentally a part of it. Reclothed in the Spirit, ultimately culminating in resurrection how good is that how good is that these two things repentance and belief they're two sides of the same coin if you believe the good news you live as jesus lived because you're transformed and because you are transformed you show that you believe in jesus do you get this and it's the nature of god's kingdom that deals with the challenge of sin. Romans 5, 8 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. This thing, and it's not a popular thing to preach on, but this thing is common to us all. We've all got challenges to deal with. We've all develop coping mechanisms, attitudes, actions that lead to choices, addictions and habits that are about self-preservation and protecting our turf, not transformation. These, These practices and habits and attitudes and actions, they do not belong to God. They do not belong to transformation. The pain that we have, if it is not transformed, it will be transferred. These things belong to something else, not God. The, re- the Bible reveals a number of definitions for sin. There's, there's the sins of omission, you know, where Paul kind of lamenting, I do not do the good that I know I do for the, you know, and I do the bad things that I don't want to do for the sin that lives within. It's the sin of omission. Romans 7 and 15 and 20. But then there's those intentional things where we intentionally break the law. That that whole idea of sin being lawlessness. The fact of the matter is uh, the Greeks use the word adika, which is all wrongdoing in John, um, John 1 John 5 and 17. All wrongdoing, whether it breaks a law or not. That brings in a moral element. Then... Paul kind of goes on in Romans 14 and 13 that everything that doesn't come from faith is sin. Whoa. Which is the reverse of the expression, the just will live by faith. And the fact of the matter is we're members of a race that rejected relationship with God and his sovereignty. We don't become sinners by sinning. We sin because we are sinners. Saved by grace, yes. Let's not forget that. But we've got to own what's going on for us 
Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is wicked beyond measure. Who can know the depths of its brokenness? But whatever we do to secure ourselves, it falls way short of abandoning ourselves to the bigness of God, the kindness of God. It's his kindness that leads to repentance, metanoia, transformation. Whatever we do to secure ourselves, falls way short of abandoning ourselves to the goodness of God. You see, bottom line is that at its core, sin is not a list of morals or behaviours or ethics to tick off and prove righteousness. At the core, it is rejection of God. It is that simple. It's a relational violence. All of those other expressions are a result of this fundamental flaw that entered in the garden. See, the Greeks have a word, it's called hamatia, which is a tragic flaw. It kind of comes out of the Greek word hamatenen, which is to err, and it's likened to the inherent defect or the shortcoming of a hero in a tragedy who, in all other respects, is a superior being favoured by fame and fortune. Hamatia is a relational word. It's a word with no direct English equal. And that's why the translators drew on what they call dynamic equivalence. They took an archery term, an ancient archery term of missing the bull with an arrow as the equivalent And so we think that sin is simply missing the mark. A simple list of failed behaviours or morals or ethics. But the Hebrews have a number of words. One of them is kata, which is to miss or to go wrong or miss the goal. Again, it carries that kind of idea. Or avira uh, from the root word am beth resh, meaning to pass or cross over with the implied meaning of transgress or transgressing a moral boundary. Then there's the word pesha, which talks about guilt. And then there's another word avon, which is about iniquity. You see, the Hebrews considered this thing, sin, as a thought or a word or an action which is shameful or harmful to oneself, others, or to God. But you see, even that is an inadequate reckoning. Sin is not what it seems. It's not a list of actions that transgress morals, ethics, behaviours, or evidencing one has strayed from the path of righteousness. I mean, consider how this plays out in Genesis. Even though this this concept that we call sin, it's not directly mentioned, we see its effect, and that reveals what it is, regardless of the efforts that we go to to find a word to name it. Genesis reveals the destruction of relationship between human beings and God. It is that simple. So whatever name we use to name it, primarily its presence destroys relationships with God and others. It's not an action. It's an attitude of heart that works out in various ways. And the Bible says as much. Isaiah 29 and 13, the Lord says, These people come near me with their mouths but, and honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. And Jesus said something similar in Matthew 15 and 8. These people honour me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And then he goes on to say in Luke 6 and 14, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? And Luke 6 and 45, a good man brings out good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings the evil out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth 
speaks what the heart is full of. And then Luke 11 and 39, and the Lord said to him, now, now then, you see, Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. So whatever, whatever sin is, it's an attitude of heart that separates us from God and each other. The, the actions... They follow. Look, as I said earlier, I, I understand that this isn't a popular topic to talk about. It's often perceived as negative preaching, and it's something you very rarely hear preached. I know it's not something I usually harp on about. <laughs> I'd much rather speak of the positives of abundant life with Jesus. But we can't be true to the whole story of why Jesus came and what he came to achieve and address this renewal journey unless we engage it. Because fundamental in this journey is owning our stuff. We cannot come to renewal without recognising where renewal needs to take place in our lives. You know, in 1996, I went back to the Solomon Islands with a team from Woodridge Baptist Church. It's hard to fathom how much had changed in two years. The revivals had all but died out. Schisms were rife in the church and between communities. It was only another two years before the ethnic tensions of 1998 ravaged Guadalcanal with the uprisings caused by cultural complexity. You see, what was happening in Honiara, you had all of these village squats of people from Malaita living in Honiara. And in Malaita, the land goes through the mail. And all of these village squats, so there was Koa Hill in Malaita, there was Koa Hill in Honiara, a village squat of Koa Hill people. There, there was Kilisaquelo in Malaita, there was the village squat of Kilisaquelo. So each one of these villages had a vi There was Anakalo in Malaita, there was a village squat of Anakalo around Honiara. But these young Malaitan men, who were the landholders back in Malaita, they were marrying young Guadalcanalian women. And on Guadalcanal, the land belonged to the women. It went through the matriarchal line. And so the young men in the Solomon Islands were missing out both ways on their women and their land. But not only so, you then lay over the top of that the complexity of a one-tox system. Huh, it was a tinderbox. I saw it happening in 1996. Young people going through education, all impression without expression leads to depression. And these kids were hanging out in the streets outside the gambling houses, the drinking houses, nothing to do. I spoke to Charles Raffiasi at the time. I said, Charles, the church has a real opportunity to lead this country into greatness and, and develop some opportunities in terms of the global scene. That didn't happen. And then we have the repeat of Bougainville. Tragic. In 1996, we brought a fresh wave of renewal. When we went to White Hills, uh, Grassy Hills, I beg your pardon, just north of Honiara, the first morning I, I'd, I'd beaten, like I'd been telling our team from Woodridge how great it is in the Solomon Islands. And, you know, the first prayer meeting we went to just before dark and there was the pastor. And I thought, these people are going to think I've just been gilded in the lily. There was just one, the pastor. The next morning, there were two more. We were outnumbering them. We're, we're burning for Jesus here. 
in the Solomon Islands. How good is this? And the wheels had fallen off. After about day five, the whole community was turning out. Our gathering went from 30 to overflowing and sitting on the, the trees that had been felled for seats outside. The meeting started at 8.30 in the morning and was still belting on at 5 o'clock in the evening without a breath as far as stopping. And the preaching rolled and the worship rolled and it was just absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. God really blessed our time but sadly it didn't last but for us at Mary Barra Baptist Church I've been here long enough to know our heart that we all have yearning for Jesus I absolutely am convinced of that we have what is necessary God has done everything that is necessary. The question is, are we prepared to take him at his word again? See, in Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, When the Jews were cut to the heart, when they heard the gospel of Jesus and the hope in him, they said, what should we do? What should we do? And he said, repent. In other words, be transformed. Be transformed. Turn to God. That your sins may be wiped out. The times of refreshing will come from the Lord. So, as we start to reflect a little this morning, we need, to, we need to own our stuff. Where are you attempting to ramp up your security and self-preservation and protect your turf? What, what, what pain do you need to have transformed so it's not transferred to others. Are there relationships that need to be reconciled and restored? That was the, that was the one stark, absolutely in-your-face thing that I saw, the difference between 1994 and 1996 in the Solomon Islands. There was no reconciliation, restoration. There was schism, division, conflict. Restoration, reconciliation is the way of God and it opens the opportunity for the flow of God's spirit among God's people. So are there relationships that need to be reconciled and restored? And then we have to ask ourselves, are we prepared to make the pursuit of renewal, a way of life. And how, how can I help? How can we help one another? Can I pray with you? Can we pray together? What do we need? Because the fact of the matter is, the communion table tells us a great story of sacrifice. A great story. You know, we've got movies around us that are built around the story of someone taking a bullet on behalf of another. Even in Australia on Anzac Day, we talk about Simpson and his donkey. Greater love had no man than this, than he who will lay down his life for his friends. The Australian War Memorial has got this picture of Simpson and his donkey, and there's the caption. One who lays down their life for another. If someone took a bullet for you, wouldn't that change the way you live? I know it would me. Well, we've all got someone who took a bullet for us. And that person is Jesus. And this, this table 
is unveiled, unmasking for us the reality that it's God's kindness, Romans 2 and 4, it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. We have a life that has been poured out in death. that we might live. That we might live. It has to change everything, doesn't it? Doesn't it? It has to change everything. It means we put the axe and the grindstone away, doesn't it? Isn't that what it means? It means we look to one another and say, my brother, my sister, that one of the things I love about us at Maryborough Baptist Church is that, that we are family. Sadly, June's not here, but I'd be saying a, a bunch of licorice all sorts. All unique, all different, but wonderful in him. Wonderful. Because a life was poured out in death to bring to us life. I'm going to ask Phil, Tiana and Troy to, to minister a song to us this morning as we come and the stewards if you could come please and, and we will pray just before, just before you go you, you start um, Tiana, Troy just really appreciate you pulling this together I can't wait to hear it This is a song that makes me cry. It reminds me of that day on my face in the Solomon Islands. It reminds me of that day. Let's pray together. Father, we're so grateful for the life that was poured out in death that we might live. That this morning we, we listened to this ministry to own our stuff, to say, God, would you take it from us? Would you reconcile and restore as you have reconciled and restored us to you, that you might reconcile and restore us to each other? body broken the blood shed a life we never lived a death we never died that we put our trust in for eternity and so we say thank you for Jesus
So what can be done? An old hard life mine. Soften it up with oil and wine. The oil is you, your spirit of love. Please wash me anew in the wine of your blood. Let's drink together. As we bring this morning to close, Tiana and the team will lead us through a song, Refresh My Heart, Refresh My Heart, Lord, Renew My Love, Pour Your Spirit into My Soul, Refresh My Heart. And if, if there have been elements of this morning's ministry that has moved your heart, that you feel a need to respond to God in prayer, We've got Tony, Tim and Gwen available to pray with you. We've got a fantastic team of deacons. And if I go to name them all, I'll miss one. But I'd love to pray with you as well. Let's renew today, each one of us. Renew in our faith. Renew in our hearts. Renew in our relationship with God renew in our relationship with each other. Let's say the things that we need to say to one another with kindness and love. Let's weep tears of sadness but joy because the Lord is among us and he is doing a work to renew us for the glory of his name. my heart
Father, we thank you so much for your love and for your sacrifice on the cross for us. There are days where we take it for granted, but Lord, remind us to constantly come to your feet and give our burdens to you. Lord, we love you. Amen. Well, thank you for coming this morning. It's been just amazing to be able to just worship God together. And now we're going to come into a time of fellowship. We can join us in the back with some tea and coffee. So thank you. We'll see you next week. (laughs) 